I've been um, really uh, actively fighting for disability justice for 22 years, you know, saying disability and race need to be brought together. Living authentically as yourself is so much more powerful than, you know, hiding aspects of your life to appease to other people. I think that the greatest gift is, April, what you call crip kinship, is just knowing that I love us. I love our community. This week, we're talking about disability identity. Deep conversations, real honest stories, and complex, relevant issues, all examined through a disability lens. This is In Focus. Hi, I'm April Hubbard. Welcome to In Focus. Tiffany Yu is a disability advocate, entrepreneur, and content creator. She is CEO of Diversability, founder of the Awesome Foundation Disability Chapter, and host of the social impact podcast, Tiffany and You. She lives in San Francisco. Cyrus Marcus Ware is an award-winning artist, activist, and educator who co-founded the Performance Disability Art Collective, Black Lives Matter Canada, and the Wild Seed Centre for Art and Activism. He is an assistant professor at the School of the Arts at McMaster University. He lives in Takaronto, Toronto. I'm joined virtually by these two superstars of the disability community, Cyrus, Tiffany, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much. Honored to be here. Tiffany, you started your anti-ableism series during the pandemic. Can you tell us a bit about the series and what drew you to create it? Sure. You know, when I originally started on TikTok, I was creating a lot of content around how I live life, uh, being able to only use one arm. One of my arms is paralyzed. And that was like a different kind of advocacy content, but it wasn't really what I had kind of spent the past 12 or 13 years doing, which is more advocacy, disability allyship work. And so about a year and a half ago, I decided to start this anti-ableism series. It originally started as the Anti-Ableism Daily, which was inspired by a newsletter that my friend Nicole Cardoza had started called the Anti-Racism Daily. But then I was like, I'm disabled, so I don't know if I can do this on a daily basis. But now, today, we're already at part 180. Uh, and these are, you know, 15 to 30 second bite-sized ways to be a better ally to disability. And it can range from, here's some stats you might not know, here's some language that you might not know is actually ableist, and here are some alternatives, uh, the, whole, the whole range. And then even a lot of the series that's inspired by comments that people leave uh, on the series as well. Thanks, Tiffany. Crip theory combines theories from the disability justice and queer communities. Cyrus, what strengths come from combining the beliefs of these two communities? I think it's really um, important to recognize the amazing work that uh, QT, BIPOC, uh, disabled, mad, and deaf people ha have done and have, have done in terms of creating community, creating, uh, you know, a sense of uh, a, a new kind of world that we could be moving into. If you look at some of the early organizing, whether we're looking at Marsha P. Johnson, who famously said, I may be crazy, but that don't make me wrong. Or if you look to, you know, contemporary uh, QT BIPOC, um, um, deaf, mad and disabled folk, I'm thinking of, of course, Stacey Milburn, Sina, thinking about all of these incredible folks who are helping us to think in new ways. What they're doing is they're giving us an opportunity to imagine a different kind of future. So I think bringing these two things together, we, you know, we're not living single issue lives, as Audre Lorde reminds us, that we need to think uh, uh, collectively. Our work uh, needs to be interlocking, it needs to be intersectional, it needs to be connected. Marsha P. Johnson also famously said that if one of us doesn't have our rights, none of us have our rights. So we have to be thinking about this as a holistic issue disability justice, queer justice, these are two things that have always gone together. Yes, it's an important reminder for all of us. Tiffany, why do we need to talk about Crip Joy? I think when we don't, it's another way that our community is dehumanized. And I think that, yes, we will have hard moments and moments of struggle because we are human beings, but we will also have moments of feeling like we're thriving or you know, sitting in immense spaces of joy. I had this like interesting thought the other day and I was like, there's kind of like 
three tiers on this ladder of like where I'd love disability allyship to move toward. Uh, at the bottom tier, you start with how can we get people to unlearn their thinking that disability is tragic? Then the second rung is how can we get people to understand that disabled people are human beings who have an entire range of emotions, right? You could, you could potentially see joy fitting in that. And then the third, you know, is something that I learned from Stephanie Thomas, which is how can we see disability as aspirational? I just want people to understand, like, I want them to see Crip Joy because I want people to be able to see our community as aspirational, whether or not you identify as disabled yourself. Oh, I love that. Cyrus, can you share with our audience what Crip Time has meant to you? Um, I think that, you know, I'm here, I have COVID, I'm, I'm participating from my bed. We participate from different environments. We create different, t- different creations of time and space where different things are possible, you know, and then and in a non-disabled household, the bedroom maybe is only a space that is occupied eight hours of the night, you know, and doesn't really, you know, but for the rest of us, it can become this space where uh, it's a community center and it's, uh, you know, it's it's all, of, you know, it's, it's a school, it's a workplace, it's everything. Uh, it's our art studios, it's our protest uh, rallies. So we're creating, uh, we're redefining time and space. And that's what Crip Time kind of means to me is this, this, absolute necessity to embrace the expansion of time and this need to root it in the idea that we go at the slowest pace of the slowest person. And how has embracing your disability identity allowed you to experience Crip kinship? Um, Yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, I was disabled uh, as a kid. I had like um, a couple of different uh, issues. I was born with um, two and a half kidneys and a double ureter. And I had a lot of complications and was having a lot of surgeries. And, uh, uh, you know, at the same time, didn't really identify strongly as disabled. It was hard for me to kind of first get get that. But then, of course, you know that moment when you get politicized and then that beautiful moment of activism and love that grows in your heart when you feel that sense of what justice could potentially look like. You know, I took a disability studies class in 2006 and really wanted to find myself, my, to find home there, you know? And I had gone uh, into that class looking for a home and instead found, you know, just the whiteness of disability, study, disability studies. I've been um, really uh, actively fighting for disability justice for 22 years, you know, saying disability and race need to be brought together. Um, and, uh, you know, that's made my life so much more beautiful. You know, I've found community through um, my experience, you know, sort of queer community that I have here in Tagorondo and how we are just sort of here for each other and we show up for each other. And it's just such a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's a really wonderful blessing. And what has been the biggest gift you've received thanks to your disability identity? Uh, I've been disabled for 25 years. For the first 12 years of that, I spent sitting in spaces of victimization, pity, and shame. And for the last 13 years, I have rooted myself and built a disability community. And I think that the greatest gift is, April, what you call Crip kinship, is just knowing that I love us. I love our community. I love how interdependent we are the different types of mutual aid. We are looking to support each other, to lift us up. Um, and so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad that I found my people. Um, I'm extremely grateful for that and that I can support others on the path to being proud of who they are and, and liberated in one way or another. I think I would have to say that, you know, I've really been able to um, follow my heart and follow my 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 desires for this life. You know, being disabled, um, being mad, already kind of set me aside a little bit from the sort of mainstream, you know, rat race. You know, and I think that's a gift. You know, it allowed me to have the time 
to um or to have the, the to have the space to build an art career to you know get involved in activism to organize so it's been really um beautiful and then i think the family that i've built the family that i've built through these connections and through this organizing thank you both for sharing your thoughts tiffany cyrus i've really enjoyed getting to know you today thanks so much for having me thanks so much what a great conversation Coming up, embracing the real you. Now I'm like, screw it. Let's just live for yourself. What makes you comfortable? And now I rock this prosthetic metal post leg. In Focus will return. You're watching In Focus. Our next story is about a woman who's part of a new generation of disabled content creators who are owning their authentic selves, speaking out about body positivity, and modeling a better world for all of us. I like to pull all my legs out and place them on my bed to plan out my content. Sounds so weird. Most people would do outfits, I do legs. <laughs> Alison Lang of Montreal is creating content for her latest TikTok post. I am a congenital amputee. I was born missing the lower half of my left leg at birth. Allison is a model, athlete, traveler, and disability advocate. Tripod, super quick to set up. For this post, she's making a humble brag about having the best leg collection in town. This isn't something you see every day, hey? <laughs> I love using the sounds and making jokes to create videos in order for people to connect and laugh online and know that, you know, they don't have to tiptoe around those with disabilities, that we can actually make fun of ourselves and enjoy life. I think I enjoy making them more than people enjoy watching them sometimes. <laughs> I used to be obsessive about how my everyday leg looked. And just recently, I took a knife to my prosthetic. This sounds so bad, I, I know, but I cut the foam apart to expose the metal rod of my leg. I feel like I can't fully advocate for those with disabilities without being confident and showing my metal leg. When I go to festivals, I do bedazzle my leg with like rhinestones and jewels and or string lights around it because I think, you know, I might as well have fun with this leg that I have and not many other people can do the same thing. <laughs> Allison wasn't always comfortable identifying as disabled. To be quite honest, I used to hate the word disability, disabled. Um, I didn't associate myself with that word at all. I was severely bullied when I was in elementary. I was called things like peg leg and Barbie and I, boys would tell me to my face that they would never love me or never have a crush on me because I was different. Sports offered a reprieve. She's currently training to qualify for the 2024 Paralympics. I actually was scouted by Volleyball Canada to try out for their sitting national team when I was 16 years old. So that was my saving grace because I had always been athletic and I met this amazing group of women that were like me and we had this common ground and I think it started to teach me that I could accept myself. Through sport and social media, Allison found herself. I started to realize that I could be a voice for younger girls that struggled like I struggled and I I'm so regretful that I didn't start this self-love journey earlier because I'm starting to lear learn that living authentically as yourself is so much more powerful than, you know, hiding aspects of your life to appease to other people. Now I'm like, screw it. Let's just live for yourself. What makes you comfortable? And now I rock this prosthetic metal post leg that is just lighter, easier on my hips, my gait, my overall health. And I think I've built my confidence around that. Hey everyone, um, I hope everyone's enjoying the beautiful weather. I'm out back in the groove of running for the summer with my running leg. I'm doing this with purpose and that purpose is to 
be some sense of hope for someone going through a hard time, whether or not they have a disability, whether they are just really insecure about something with their body, they can look to other people that have fully embraced who they are. And as long as that took me to find my place in this world and really truly accept who I was, I would love to speed up that process for someone else just by showing up online as who I am. Coming up, conversations with friends. It's not always that I'm hiding it because of shame. Sometimes I'm just so tired of talking about it. Yeah. Like, you don't get a day off. In Focus will return. This is In Focus. Continuing my exploration of disability identity, I'm in North End Halifax at one of my favorite cafes to meet up with my friends Maddie McDonald and Joy Carvery to chat about our lives and about disability. Where do you fit in on identifying or not identifying with the disability label? I am comfortable using it. Like for myself, I know who I am, I know how my body works. Um, I don't always feel accepted in using it. Um, just because like I don't I don't look uh, disabled. I don't people can't see what's wrong with me. I'm sitting with with you two. Um, I'm very proud to say that I you know that I live with multiple disabilities. Um, I have a, a, a few different disabilities and some are so easy to talk about. Like I'm type 1 diabetic. Most people have a sense of what that is, but if I talk about some of my other, like um, my chronic migraines, my fibromyalgia, um, my, my post-traumatic stress disorder, like um, some of them have more stigma attached and so I'm a lot less likely to identify with it around certain people or in certain circumstances. Yeah, yeah. it's complicated. It, it is, it's a really complicated thing. Where does that stigma come from, do we think? I tend to find race a big factor for me, like culture and identity. Um, I don't, I feel like a lot of people have stereotypes about my culture. And then uh, if I talk to them about like something like pain, and that, you know, I do need medication to, mm -hmm. to help my pain, uh, I get a lot of stereotypes like you're just looking for drugs. Um, you know, it's just, oh, it's in your head. It's not always that I'm hiding it because of shame. Sometimes I'm just so tired of talking about it. Yeah. Like, you don't get a day off. I stay away from talking about it so much that when it does come out, I might sound a little um, defensive or I might come across as more abrupt than I mean to. I find I'm more emotional. Right. Because I hide it for so long. And so the only time I'm really like, 100% honest about it is in the doctor's office. And when I have to talk about that, I end up crying right. every single time. Like it right. just happens, so. It does. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of emotion that builds up there. Yeah. And then not having a diagnosis puts you in this place of feeling like, you know, am I entitled to say that? You know, um, for years living with uh, being neurodivergent and ADHD and on the spectrum, I never spoke of it, ever. Um, because you know I didn't have the label, and and so is that a, a place that I'm allowed to to be part of? And so just recently, I've started to accept that, you know, I can talk about it. I don't I don't need someone to tell me how my that my brain is different. Yeah. I experience it day to day. Do you find that any of your other intersectional identities have made it easier or harder to identify as having a disability? For me, I, you know, I'm part of the, the queer and trans community and, you know, being queer and being trans, there's such a, there's such a community that embraces being disabled among the queer community. Mm -hmm. And so that has helped me identify as, as being disabled. And, to kind of own my disability, you know? For me, it, it's the cultural um, race thing, you know, as a, as a, a black person, um, 
I don't feel I'm believed as much, uh, especially around levels of pain. Does it feel like you can only talk about racism or it definitely or does. ableism, yes. but not both yes. at the same time? I'm either in the disabled community or in the black community, right. but I'm not in both at the same time. There's not a black disabled community who get together or anything right. like that. So That's it's, hard. Yeah, it's very hard. I think I, I lived um, a disabled life for so many years before I identified as being disabled, like Definitely. so many years. You know, I grew up understanding I had an illness, but not a disability. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until I layered on a couple other diagnoses that I was like, I think I am actually disabled. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Medical professionals actually would say things to me because I, I was diagnosed very young mm -hmm. and they'd be like, you better make sure you do these things before you become disabled, before you, be, you know. And so I did, in many years of my life, I, I was like, I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, even though I need these things, I need these accommodations made, or, or I, these things are affecting my life. Um, but I still would be like, but no, I'm, I'm still young. And like when I'm older, I will be disabled. Right. And I think it's those beliefs that really keep us attached to our internalized ableism and fighting a lot of things that could help us. Right. For many folks with intersecting identities, there can be real consequences to being openly disabled. But today's guests were able to share their identities and in turn found a supportive community that invited them to grow. That's it for In Focus this week. Thanks for joining me. Host, April Hubbard. Producer, Wendy Purvis. Videographer, Andrew Pickup. Editors, Roland Borshert, Andrew Pickup. Freelance cameras, Norman Germain, Scott Barrington. Segment producer, Jillian Gillis. Narrator, Grant Hardy. Media accessibility specialist, M. Williams. Audio post, Mark Phoenix. Graphics, Mike Smith. Opening theme package composed by Matthew Monius for Matt Mac Music. Senior producer, Michelle Dudas. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2022 Accessible Media Incorporated.